My topic today is Yes We Can, Women and Leadership. I guess in a way, I can exemplify that. I want to talk a little bit about why it's important. I will draw from my own experience, and those of you who've been watching TV3 might know a little bit more about that uh, over the last couple of weeks. And I want to end with a rallying cry for all of us to support women coming into leadership positions, whatever they are. Obviously, my experience is mostly in political leadership, but I advocate for women in leadership right across every area of life. So, do we need to ask the question, is it important to have women in leadership? I think we do. You know, when you count up the number of elected women leaders around our world, at any one time, I understand, it has never exceeded 20. UN has 193 member states. Under 20 is a pretty small proportion of that. Back in 2000, I went up to the UN Millennium Summit, and Mary Robinson, who had been president of Ireland and was the UN Human Rights Commissioner, decided to convene a meeting of all the women heads of government who were attending that big summit, uh, and the women heads of agency at the UN. I won't say we would have fitted in one telephone box, but we probably would have fitted in two. That wasn't good, but it's not immensely better today. So let's then look at the women who make it to Parliament as decision makers. Again, back around the time of that Millennium Summit, there was a goal set of having 30% of the legislators in a country women. Well, it's not 50%, but it's not a bad start. And it's where New Zealand got to in 1996. Haven't moved a lot above it since, but we got there. We achieved the goal. What is it today, globally? On average, under 20%. So I think we do have to ask the question, is it important, and answer yes. And answer yes because, in my experience, if you are out of sight, you're out of mind. And I think our decision makers and our parliaments and all our representative bodies, we should look like the society we represent, not look like some segment of the society which doesn't then share the perspectives of a much broader cross-section. So who misses out because women aren't putting issues on the agenda at the top tables? Well, let's come back to those Millennium Development Goals which came out of the uh, 2000 Millennium Summit. And another of those goals was Goal 5. It was to reduce the rate of maternal mortality, that's women dying in pregnancy and childbirth, by three quarters between 1990 and 2015. Has this been achieved? No. What about another target in that goal, universal access to sexual and reproductive health services? Has that been achieved? No. I go to a lot of countries uh, around the world. It's not uncommon to go to countries and see that when women are surveyed, do you have access to family planning services, and would you like them? More than 30% say, we'd like to, but it's not there for us. So what does that do? It fundamentally disempowers women from making their own decisions about the number of children they wish to have, how they wish to space them, and of course, it doesn't help uh, to stay healthy through the children that you are having. If there's too many, too fast, and you haven't been able to control that decision. So, in my view, if we had more women at these top tables, in these legislatures, these things would start to become rather more important. And I'll give you an example of the kind of difference which having a lot of women uh, in decision-making uh, can make. And it's an example drawn from India, where when you look at the councils led by women, as against the councils led by guys, the ones led by women are 60% more likely to prioritize clean and safe drinking water as a priority for their area, really emphasizing something so basic, so important to health and to the society. So I really believe 
that it does make a difference. Another example, a lot of people go hungry in our world today, around a billion. So food production is pretty important. Go to sub-Saharan Africa, more than half the farmers are believed to be women. But all the evidence suggests that the women farmers are not as productive as the male farmers. I'm sure they work every bit as hard, but they're not as productive. Why is this? Well, firstly, in many cases, they can't own the land. They can't inherit the land. They can't borrow money. They may not be able to open a bank account. Uh, apparently, not even get equal access to the advisory services which make you a more productive farmer. Add it all up, you produce less. You're less productive. And yet, if you could shift that, if you could really put the emphasis on women's status and rights which would enable the women to be as productive as the men, you could start to make some real inroads, not only into women's poverty by lifting incomes, but actually by lifting the production of food, you could have fewer hungry people as well. So we need women putting these issues on the agendas from the top table. Now, I said I'd draw a little bit from my own experience. And I think it, it probably does help on the journey to leadership to be born the first in the family and not have any brothers. But we tend not to have much control over that. <laughs> but that was part of my, my story. I, I grew up in a home where there were no girls' jobs and boys' jobs. There were just jobs. And you mucked in and you did those jobs. I also had parents who really believed in me and backed me all the way. And everyone can be that parent and back their girl children as much as they back their boy children. And so I went through life with this, this background of uh, believing that girls could do anything, going to the university, not seeing so many top women staff in the university, I have to say, when I was a student. They were a very, very rare uh, breed as well. But sort of moving on into the uh, political scene as a young person, and it did strike me as a little bit strange uh, when I first stood for Parliament in a seat that really could be won by my party that not everybody thought girls should or could do everything and that you started to run into some barriers. Now, I think with taking women through into decision-making and leadership positions, uh, there are personal factors and there are structural factors. And on the structural factors, Political parties have to believe in women and they have to back them for selection, where they can win. Then, in the campaign phase, parties need to back the women there too, because we look around the world, we see women are less likely to have access to the money that funds campaigns. So that's got to be looked after. And in quite a lot of places, women need physical security while they're campaigning. It can be extremely dangerous uh, to put yourself up for public office. And then another structural factor, when women are elected, the organization of the workplace needs to be conducive. Yes, you need the parliamentary crash. Yes, you need the parliament organized so that the school holidays are when uh, the breaks are. You need the, the working hours to be reasonable, and you need to keep you know, supporting and encouraging uh, the women who are there. And I think back over many long and difficult years in, in politics, uh, the upside usually more than the downside, but there is a downside, to have a very strong network of people backing you and believing you, in you is absolutely indispensable. So you take those hard yards, but it has to mean something. There's got to be a purpose of wanting these jobs. And there were many uh, purposes for me, uh, many parts of the mission, but I like to think that as a woman leader and looking at many other women leaders, not all, but many, and many other women in elected positions, you, you try to bring a gender-sensitive eye to policies. And you try to look out for things that would really make a difference to women. Uh, back in the late 1980s, I was a health minister. One of the things I got to do uh, was to legislate through Parliament for our midwives to practice autonomously. I really believed in that. 
I believe that the midwife was very, very capable, competent, and professional, and should be able to uh, work with a woman and her family right through the birthing process. Today, in New Zealand, this almost seems like ancient history because almost everywhere the birth is uh, conducted by the, the midwife. But it was a huge breakthrough going back uh, more than 25 years, and one I'm proud of. <laughs> but then sort of fast forward to Prime Minister. What are some of the things you can do that will make a difference? Well, firstly, paid parental leave as a right. I think it's important. And and, and it shouldn't just be something that comes because you're a member of the strongest union that's been able to negotiate it. Some had, but many hadn't. And so to have that right for women and men to have time to bond with a small baby, a paid uh, period of leave, I thought was important. I also thought it was important to provide for the 20 hours free early childhood education. Because again, you know, a woman is weighing, will, will I go back to work? What choice will I make? And sometimes that choice can be very hard if the money you're making for working so hard barely pays the childcare early childhood fees. So to have that support was very, very important. Uh, then there was the annual holidays, which had been stuck at three weeks a year since 1972 or 73. That got extended out a year, again, because when parents are working, they need a bit of time to cover the school holidays and be with their families. So that, that's really important. I'm proud of that. And one other issue of this kind I want to mention, those student loans. You know, when I became Prime Minister, they were extortionate. And what the calculations showed was that for many women, they would die still owing the money <laughs> because the incomes earned through life and the proportion you paid back was just, just wasn't enough to actually pay uh, the loan back. Uh, so one of the best things I think we ever did was to get rid of the interest on the student loans, and it certainly helped the woman uh, go through life without owing a lot of money. Mm. I, I want to mention one last issue that, for me, is one that I saw through uh, a gender-sensitive lens. And it's an issue of, of war and peace. When I was a kid, uh, I was very close to my grandmother. And my grandmother lost her closest brother uh, about a month before the end of the First World War. He was in the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. They stormed the Hindenburg Line uh, somewhere near Le Quenwa, and he was killed. It was very devastating. When World War II broke out, my grandmother had two sons, one of whom was my father, who were pretty close to call of age. And as the story went, she burst into tears and said, you know, are we born as women to bear sons who will be sent away and never come back? And I never forgot that. Uh, for me, uh, when the pressure went on around the invasion of Iraq, I knew it wasn't right. And I would think there'd hardly be a woman in New Zealand who <laughs> agreed with that, but a lot of guys as well. Because if you can take that decision to send other people's kids away to fight, you better know it's pretty important. And if it's not right, you should not take that decision. And I think that that's uh, perhaps very much a women's way of lo looking at it. But it's one that's important to me. <laughs> so what I'm arguing for is, yes, we can, but when we get to these positions of leadership, it's got to mean something. You know, there's got to be a passion for it. There, there's got to be a mission. And I also argue for looking after yourself while you do it. You know, positions of power and leadership, they come and go. I had a career that kind of went like that, like that, like that. Careers do. Now, it's important to come out of it still having your health. You've got to eat properly. You've got to sleep properly. You've got to exercise, and you've got to stay close to your family and friends, because otherwise, you come out of a very intense period of a career in leadership of some kind, and you might think you can flick back to where you were and the family were uh, a few years before. No, they'll have moved on, and they'll have moved on without you if you hadn't kept them close. So I always argue for an approach 
to career and leadership, which is a balanced one. And again, I, I think that uh, women perhaps see those issues much more personally because no matter how much gender equity uh, we think there is, isn't it somehow always women who take disproportionate responsibility for the care of the older and frail relatives, the relatives with disability, relatives with illness, and children? And we do like to have that balance in our lives so we can look after that part of our life as well. So reflecting on these things, I say, yes, we can. I say it is important because there's a lot of issues out there which are so important to women. And in my job now, I see the life and death issues which are so important to women. Where women are out of sight, out of mind. They're not at the top table. They're not driving the decisions. If they were there in the numbers that are warranted, I think our world would be a different and a better place. And I said I'd end with a rallying cry, and it is a rallying cry to support those women who are prepared to stand up and walk over burning coals to make a difference for other women and men and families. This matters to me, and I hope it matters to you too. Thank you. Thanks.